Welcome, everybody. I'm joined today by Jackie Cooper, CEO of Blockchain Legal Institute and founder. Really excited to have Jackie on today. I've worked with her several times with the Blockchain Legal Institute. I've come up as a speaker for their global summit, and Jackie's just been doing incredible work in the world of blockchain, specifically pertaining to work in the legal realm. So, you know, they they put together this comprehensive educational library. So Jackie's a huge advocate for education in the space, and I'm thrilled to have you on today, Jackie. So yeah, I'll, I'll pass it off to you now to give your introduction. I, I'm super excited to be here. I know that you and I connected at Eat Denver, and I was experiencing my first hackathon, which was just phenomenal. And um, everything that you've done in the space, I also you know, want to thank you because you've been a mentor to so many people. And so um, I definitely love to have, you know, follow in your footsteps as well. So my background for those that who don't know anything about me is I am a lawyer, even though I'm not practicing traditional law, but I'm also in the education space and I've been a career switcher. So it, no matter where you start in your career area, you're going to be learning skills that will apply all over. So I'm right now in special education elementary, and I am loving that because of the working with kids with diverse learning styles. And I'm, I'm that includes me as well. So, you know, in learning about blockchain, um, it felt comfortable to me. And in starting the Blockchain Legal Institute, um, there's a really cool origin story that I know we're gonna talk about, but I feel really compelled to make sure that everyone who is coming forward into the space um, has reliable resources because it's really important that no matter what what you think you're doing, that you have validation that it's correct. Absolutely. And I, just seeing all the work you put into education in the space, I think that's one of the reasons we really hit it off. And in fact, I was actually speaking at ETH Toronto. I was on a panel talking about DAOs. I think that's the first time I actually met you. Yeah. Uh, you came over and like, kudos to you for just being so outgoing and willing to network and make connections. Like you beelined it to me right after the panel and you're like, hey, we got to talk. We should do things together. Uh, and I love that energy because I'm, I'm very similar. I love connecting with people in person. So uh, I love that you took initiative there. Um, so yeah, I, I would love to explain to our students and listeners today what DLI is and you know some of the problems that you're tackling. So uh, Jackie, I'll pass it off to you and we'll get into our workshop here. Um, and this is Blockchain Legal 101, everybody. So Jackie will be going over some of the problems they're solving and also ways for you to get involved with the Blockchain Legal Institute. So Jackie, yeah. I'll pass it off to you. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. So just a little more background about me. My major in college um, was multidisciplinary. So it was science, technology, and society. And originally, I was looking at patients' rights and a lot of other, you know, really interesting areas. I learned about blockchain about nine years ago. And when I learned about blockchain, it really felt like I was coming home because it had policy at a tech. You know, I, I realized that I knew nothing. <laughs> I was really like a pre-K person trying to understand how do I open up a wallet? Where do I go for resources? I met a woman in Scotland and she helped me. And um, because of her help and because of meeting other people in the space, I decided to start um, my first of four talk shows, Crypto Mom 2. And the reason why I did that is I figured even though I'm highly educated, if I was struggling, then others might be. And I really wanted to provide resources for everyone. So I started to call people, well, not call physically on the phone, but, you know, online message people say, can I interview you? And as a result of doing that, I learned about NFTs. I learned about Bitcoin. I learned about Ethereum. I learned about, you know, protocols. And um, I really felt that everyone was in this space mentoring. And I really felt appreciative. Part of what happened with Blockchain Legal Institute and its origin story, which is very special, Um, Going back to the fact that I've been in the education space for about 17 years, I'm a single mom. And so she's 27 now, off doing great things. But I realized that there was a disconnect between adults talking with young adults talking and young adults might be gaming. Adults might be buying an altcoin token or whatever, and there wasn't a communication. So I started writing. So I started writing fairy tales, the Bitcoin Cinderella, the Bitcoin Cinderella and the Seven Dwarves. And the reason why I mention that is because of the fact that at one of the conferences I was at, um, 
I was at the booth giving away my book and a young attorney came up to me and asked for help in terms of how to step into blockchain and, and the space, the law space. And when she stepped away, I turned to my co-founder um, and I said, there's no library of resources for our decentralized space. And that really is what the Blockchain Legal Institute is. It is a decentralized library of resources. So it covers a little bit of everything. It has verticals about AI, Ethereum, blockchain use cases, Bitcoin, the laws around the states, the laws around the world. We have interns who intern with us and we craft the internship based upon what it is that they would like to do. And interns are all, all ages from colleges to graduate schools to law schools. So again, if you're listening and you would like to become part of the internship, we welcome you. So, but one of the things that I also realized being a mom is exactly what this slide is showing is how do you claim your digital empire? Because I realized that when I asked my daughter, you know, did she have an interest in learning where my investments were, and this is when she was a lot younger, she said, no, I said, well, you need to, because wherever I'm investing, you need to know how to reach, reach it because it's your experience. So I'm going to continue with the slides a little bit. And as I mentioned, uh, I'm the one of the co-founders. Matt Rogers is also one of our founders, and he also um, has a company called CSI, which deals with credentialing uh, standards, which is very important in the blockchain area. And the Blockchain Legal Institute actually really covers six problems that we saw exist. One, there was no centralized library of decentralized resources. Two, there was limited continuing legal education classes for attorneys. And that was exactly what I you know, shared with you. Three, the ch there was a changing compliance consideration around the globe. In every country, it's changing. And we see that in the EU with AI and other spaces. And there's a lack of bilingual materials to support digital asset knowledge. Now, the Blockchain Legal Institute's website you can go down to the bottom and it will flip into 45 different languages. So that was one of the things that we thought was really important because not everyone is totally fluent in, in English. And it was important to have resources in the native language. And then the other area that was really concerning to me is we're very casual as consumers about our digital assets. And digital assets are not just NFTs or cryptocurrency. It could be trademarks, it could be, you know, your online domains. But if we were to, if, if you as a, a, a student who's listening bought a house, you would tell your friends and families, I bought a house. And if something happens to me, you should get it. Or, you know, I'll put a will and you'll get it. We don't do the same thing with our digital assets. And no matter what your age, you need a will. That's bottom line. It can be a handwritten will, whatever, but you need to say what, what your assets are, and where you want them to go. And that's the other thing. The last thing that we saw was a problem that needed to be addressed was inconsistent business blockchain consulting regarding digital assets. As, as everyone who is within the space knows, there are sometimes liquidity issues that you just don't know about when you start to invest on different protocols. So that's why it's important to kind of research and do a little background research. In fact, I, I won't say the name of the platform, but I was researching a platform about... Um, well, I'm not going to say, but I saw two individuals on there that were in the news just six months ago, and they were investors on this platform. So I question the safety of the platform, even though it might be perfectly fine. But again, though, that's why you have to do your own research. So basically, BLI's mission um, is to provide bilingual materials have an ongoing portable academy so you can take free classes, some paid as well, um, and the internships. There are free events. We had, we've had two virtual global summits that are embedded in our um, uh, homepage. And we're gonna have another one in October, which is just gonna be about sustainability issues. The first virtual event, we had the premier of Bermuda, who was our keynote. The last virtual event, we had the president of Liberland as our keynote. And we had on um, both of those over 20 individuals from all around the world and different um, businesses talk about real world assets, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whole slew of other great topics. And so those are free events that will help all of you continue to learn because 
it's an evolving space. We all need to be adult learners. And then the other thing that we offer, which I, as I mentioned, is really important, is digital asset estate planning and blockchain business consulting. And it's not myself that's doing it. We actually have members who are in business and also other lawyers and other within our community. So that's part of our overview mission. And one of the things that you know, we probably don't always think about, but if you look at the statistics, Web2 has solutions. Um, you know, they definitely have solutions, but they've sort of have fallen short. And that's why we're all navigating over to Web3. Now, cryptocurrency right now, most there's a, probably this number is changing daily, but it's around 300 million. And in terms of digital assets, it's over 4.9 billion internet users. So anywhere in between is what we have to consider as digital asset ownership, which means that probably half of those individuals do not have wills. So that means that if they have an asset that happens to be online, then they're not gonna be the ones that will make the decision. It types of digital assets that you probably don't even think about, but as I was making this laundry list of assets, I know that I could even have more squares here, but again, you think about the art, you think about collectibles, but databases and data, um, ebooks, you know, tokens, airdrops. How many of you just collect these airdrops and don't even think about the value of the airdrops? I'm not just talking about from tax consideration. That doesn't bother me. But it's from the idea of those are your assets for your estate. And um, if you start to create a list of your assets, then you also realize how much you as an individual are worth you know, again, from your own personal asset perspective, software, social media content. And again, each of these areas have different rules. There's all these terms and conditions that I bet you just click yes to, and you probably don't even read. At least go in and look at them from the perspective of what happens if you get sick and you need someone else to access this content and also access um, the content if you pass. Those are those are really important questions that I never even paid attention to until recently. The other thing that I think is really important, we all have our own phones, but a friend of mine said he wanted to donate a token to his granddaughter. I said, great, what wallet are you on? And he told me, and I hadn't heard, but there's a lot of wallets that are, are perfectly fine. And I said, well, how do you access it? He said, from the phone. I said, well, that's fine. Um, but how do you access your phone? He said, with my face. I said, take it off. Your thumb, your face, you do not want your security to be your uh, your your physical body. Because if some when something happens to you, um, like I mentioned to him, your granddaughter is not going to be able to put your phone to your face. And the other thing that um, I was told recently is that even if, you know, you have the eyeball skin and everything, your body, obviously, and I do not mean to, you know, say all this and make people sad, but your body changes. So you will not have the, your phone will not digitally recognize you. Um, so that is really important um, for you to kind of consider when you are making decisions about your own security for your digital assets. Um, so we all believe in decentralization and that's why we were attracted to, you know, the, our community, but we need a digital asset will. And the reason why we need that is because we need to decide who's going to control the benefits of your digital assets. When do you want to have them sold or not sold? Again, someone who's not familiar with a token might think, oh, it's not worth anything. But in fact, you might want to hold on to it. And that's a decision that you, because you're the, the, the person that bought it, um, must, must decide. And then how do you educate your beneficiaries on how to access your inheritance? Because you, um, you might have a cold wallet, you might have a multi-sig wallet, you might have seed words or passwords or encryption keys. There's a variety of ways, whether it's on the computer or on the phone, and then Google authentication. Again, different ways that we double verify everything. It's not going to be easy, and that that's you know one of the reasons why you really need to have a checklist. And 
there are resources that I've created um, that are available on BLI. So definitely you can you know reach back over there. But you should be in control and to decide what should be done with your assets. If they should be deleted, archived, transferred, that should be your decision. So one of the things that I did create, as I mentioned, I've created a variety of things. And I created this digital asset organizer and it is on Amazon, but I, I created it for my daughter just because of the fact that I realized I'm comfortable navigating back and forth, even though it takes me a while to remember where things are. Um, she's not going to be because it's not second nature to her. And even the other day, I had opened up Slack and I had forgotten where my double authentication for Slack was. And then I realized, oh, it's my Google Authenticator. So, you know, something as simple as even that area, again, it's not always second nature when we aren't using it every day. Privacy and security. These are things that um, we hear a lot about, but we really need to be thinking about um, what happens when um, you know, you're not able to communicate certain things. And if you have a will, um, you want to make sure that you have a digital executor that can support you in keeping the information about your assets confidential, because if you put it directly in your will, that's going to be a public document. So it is important to have a digital executor um, who can understand how to navigate this Web3 world. The other thing to keep in mind is you a trust of your digital executor. You might not want to give that digital executor all the information about all your codes. You might want to have it in a, a bank account vault box or whatever and directions to in case something happens. Now there are online and we'll talk about the online sites as well, but I'm still one for paper and pen because things still happen. Service providers, as I mentioned before, every service provider has a different set of rules. And um, it's important for us to kind of look and see, do we have to have a beneficiary listed or how do we navigate this? And then that's information that also needs to be in your digital asset organization. Because if you have Facebook, if you have Alignable, if you have LinkedIn, if you have Twitter, if you, you know, there's so many different social media accounts that are being created, that's part of the list. <laughs> I know it gets hard, but it's part of the list of how do you access it? What are your passwords? And who who has permission to take things down? Again, if you take a look at this, there are really three types of asset classes. There might be more, but if you were just to kind of generalize this, the first one is really legacy, traditional things, photos, emails, some of the physical documents. The second area is more online, like your business, your cryptocurrency. And, and then the fourth one are other digital assets that might not fall into those categories. I know for me on GoDaddy, I own too many domain names. So again, it's the idea of, okay, who decides when to get rid of them, when to sell them, and how do you you know, how do you evaluate them? Again, everything, everything gets updated. You can, you know, how often does your iPhone get updated? How often does your computer need to get updated? The other day, I could not upload assets, uh, PDFs into my email. And so I called Geek Squad and they said, well, have you updated your Chrome? And I thought, no. So when we updated it, all of a sudden, it worked. So as simple as that, but because of the asset updates, that also means that um, some of those updates might impact some of the other things that you're doing. So you need to be aware of that. And in your organizer, you can also, like when you change your password, it's important to make sure that the new password is there. And 80% of us do not do that. So it's that 80, 20 rule. So again, be part of the 20. The other thing that is really important to think about is where do you fit in here? So you have, when you're creating a will or, the, or thinking about, you know, this area, you have your family, friends, and business, and that's the who in, you know, of who do you want to share the assets with? And then the what is in real life, do you have a will? Do you have a power of attorney? Do you have a trust? Do you have a safe deposit box? You know, your phone is an asset too, and has a lot of information in that phone um, and that we keep downloading apps and we just don't realize how many apps we have um, or wallets are on our phone, that type of thing too. 
And then think about the age range of where you are. Again, if you're under 17, that does not mean that you don't need a will. If you're gaming and have tokens, if you've bought Bitcoin, Ethereum, any digital assets, you need a will. You're a minor, but you need a will. If you're any other age, you also need a, a will. And I'm going to go back to the minor situation because if you have a brother or sister and they're minors and they're they're doing investments now or doing, you know, or navigating the space, they need to, with the parents, this is multi-generational, you really need to have a document that says, okay, so I would like to gift this to whoever it is. Their voice is equally important. And then you have to decide, okay, is this, you know, are you going to be working within your home or an institution? Where are you going to be putting this information? And the five questions to ask really when you're creating your own will and when you're working with an attorney is who has the access? What are your assets? Does your executor, do you want your executor to hold on to your assets or sell? Um, how should this happen? Because again, it's... Um, do you want them to hold for a certain amount of time, to certain levels of investment? And then are you doing this physically or on, with online organizers? And there are online organizers um, that we'll talk about. But like I said, I always still like the physical. 60% of Americans don't have a will. And in the UK, about 54%. So if you have any interest in this space, because if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you're creating a business, that business has a value, so you should have a will. And you should also talk about what happens if your partner, something happens to your partner. Because, um, you know, even with your founders or your other executives, you have to have a plan in place because things happen. Um, and it's something that's really important. So um, again, review your assets, make a list, review it with your family, review it with your business team. It's important because if you don't communicate this now before, this is prevention, then it's going to cost you more money later. Um, these are a variety of sites that are online sites that have, you know, where you can upload your will and other things. I will make a, a big disclaimer here. I have not checked these sites out. I do not know you know their their quality but they are online sites so you do have access to them and there are more being developed even if you decide to do an online site it's really important that you investigate the site one is that site going to be there for a while because you have to think to yourself, you might be young and you might live for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Will that site be there? And if that site's not there and you've uploaded your, your information, what will happen with that information? So that's why I still go the, the old fashioned way of paper and pen. But it is important to be you, you can you can navigate both. Just have a backup plan. Because as we know, sometimes companies fail and sometimes they go out of business. And if this is your wealth information, you want to know where it's going to be. So again, you know, if you have a question, definitely, you know, reach out. Um, this is why we've um, created the Blockchain Legal Institute. It's for questions that you have. It's a library of resources and people. And that's why we're here. So um, again, we appreciate, you know, your ability to um, be creative in this space and, and just have fun with it. Yeah. So Jackie, that was absolutely amazing. That was so informative. Um, thank you so much for covering some of these topics. Um, I, I know that a lot of, uh, you know, people listening with the University of Ethereum are younger and our students, but it's never too early to start thinking about having a safety net in place for your assets, right? I'm, I'm 28 years old and, you know, I started recently saving a 401k, right? And thinking about my future. So it's never too early to start doing that. So I, I do have a question for you. And this is just like, if you can share a story of like, you know, let's say worst case scenario, let's say something does happen to a person. They have no safety net in place. Have you heard of any stories of family or loved ones recovering digital assets? I guess my question is when you say no safety net in place, just did the family have the ability, do they have the keywords, the seed words? Do they, I mean, that's part of the challenge with families is um, we've all been taught to stay quiet about our passwords. 
because of, of how our wallets are, if you have access, I'll use Coinbase for an example, if you have access to my Coinbase account, <laughs> Yes, it would not be considered a hack if your family member was to access the Coinbase account on your behalf if you had passed and then moved that money to another um, bank account. You know, obviously, if you have their per uh, permission. So, you know, you have, you know, you have different scenarios going on when the accounts are um, accessed. Um, so it really is how knowledgeable is the family? Because if you are you know, if you're trying to go into the trust wallet or some of the other places where you have, you know, some of, some of the wallets are centralized, some of them are decentralized, some of them do not require KYC. And sometimes you actually, you've already connected your credit card or you already connected your bank account. So it's just a question of being able to access those wallets and then making the withdrawal. So, you know, again, it can be very easy if your family knows, which is why, you know, I, I did this for my daughter. I wanted her to know how do you how do you access all my all my accounts? That way she doesn't have to hassle with estates and um you know the the whole will thing. She can just move it to where she needs it and then she can account for it at that point in time. Got it. So another question I have uh, too, I, I think this is really great information and something we don't often think about uh, working in Web3, which should really be emphasized more. My, my next question for you, Jackie, is, you know, being a lawyer, working in crypto, um, have you seen any scenarios where funds have been recovered? Like what basically what are legal protections in, in instances where there are a, a hack? right? Or, or a hack does occur. What kind of legal protections are in place for individuals? And is there a certain amount? Because uh, I've seen projects that got hacked for larger amounts. And I think those are my more prioritized. But correct me if I'm wrong. I'm curious what, what that looks like and what protection for individuals are in place. And that's a really broad question. Um, the reason why I'm kind of pausing here is because with um, I am a crypto. I am a certified cryptocurrency investigator, um, and I'm also a blockchain maturity model um, assessor. And I've gotten these various, you know, degrees to have an understanding about how blockchain works. In terms of getting back a hack, uh, you have yes. There, it's not an easy. It's not easy because the there is a fiduciary duty that the exchanges have that if they know that the hack was in place that um certain funds uh funds meaning the crypto would be frozen but you still have to go through the legal system you still have to file a lawsuit you still have to um take the steps so it's not as if at least not at the moment it's not as if an indiv you you know, an individual I guess the reason why I'm sidestepping it, I was going to say it's, you know, you have to follow the steps within the, the legal system. An individual maybe can go to a, an exchange and say, Hey, um, I was hacked, you know, so what are the ramifications, but not all exchanges have insurance. And so that's the other thing is, you know, when you are in a, car crash, you know, maybe both sides have insurance, so you can stake a claim. In this situation, no pun intended about the staking, but in this situation, that's a whole area that's still being developed and that a lot of consumer protections need to be put in place. But at the same time, I don't know how much we want to have the government's hand in this because we still want freedom to make choices. I know that I'm not directly answering your question, but when I first bought my first altcoin, that altcoin, even though I still own it, does not sell in the United States anymore because I do not want the hassle of the SEC. So basically, um, again, a, a legal decision was made in the United States, which then impacted me as a consumer. So, uh, you know, I, th I think there always has to be a balance. In different states are looking at passing laws that will uh, protect individuals. And, you know, again, if this is an well, I'm thinking the United States and then you have other countries, you know, so there are there are court cases that have been decided even outside of the United States where the governments have gotten involved and you have, you know, financial crime, you know, investigations and things like that. But it's not an easy it's not like you can walk into a bank and say, hey, 
giving back my money because it's FDIC insured. Now, there are certain court just court cases that are going on right now that might change that. And if if that happens, it'll be interesting to see what um, what gets decided. Then it might end up that you know your crypto, if you especially if you're buying it through a bank or credit union, might be FDIC insured. That's you know again. Um, we'll we'll see what these court cases are going to be doing in the next few months, but right now, not so much. Great. Well, well, that was a really uh, comprehensive answer there. So thank you so much, Jackie. Yeah, I, I love it. More information, the better, right? So, okay, last question I have for you. Um, what are common pitfalls that you see people fall into? I know you briefly touched on the tax portion, but I think that's really big in our industry to make sure you're compliant. Um, that's That's been a focus of my work, uh, you know, working at Opolis, working on HR tech. So I, I would love to hear, like, what are some of the common pitfalls for people to avoid? You know, and especially from the perspective of students listening, like what things should they do as they embark on their Web3 careers or their Web3 journeys? Like what mistakes should they avoid and, and how can they have certain protections in place and uh, kind of know how to navigate those waters? Yeah, I love that question. One, be courageous and two, be smart. <laughs> From the perspective that don't believe everything you see or hear and make sure you can kind of double or triple verify the information and understand that and again, this is not legal advice, not investment advice, not financial advice. But if you are going to invest in this space, then be willing to lose it because and don't invest your student loans in it, you know, or that type of thing. There are rewards too, like any other business that you might go into. Um, this is a very creative space. And I, I would treat this like any other traditional business that you might go into. You know, think about have a have a plan, you know don't always go for broke for sure um and and understand that you can definitely have rewards but there's nothing fast about um success and the profit that you make bank it however you define banking save it and uh then reinvest so that way um you know there's always a portion of it being used for whatever your true expenses are and a portion for savings and a portion for investment i mean that's just traditional but you can apply it in this space as well um and and understand that trends are trends you know again i'm investing and i'm holding um, and I'm making certain decisions for the short term and certain decisions for the long term. So um, there's there's a lot of flash in this space, but don't don't be uh, blinded by the flash. Um, remember that there's a lot of good in this space and treat it like a business. You know, so uh, it's it's fun and enjoy it. Well, I, I love to. Uh, I love that advice, and I really want to take us out here on a high note. Mm -hmm. um, a couple things, Jackie, briefly disclaimed is that, you know, do your own research. We call it in the space DYOR. Uh, so always make sure you're double, triple checking information, doing your own due diligence when you're going into something. And, and yeah, Jackie, I, I really appreciate you taking the time today. Curious if you have any parting words of wisdom for our students and uh, listeners today. So um, get involved, like, you know, in hackathons, internships, um, you know, reach out, ask questions. Everyone in the space is so willing to help everyone. It's there. Things are changing in the legal space in every country every day. And that's why, you know, I'm really um, excited for a lot of the things that we're uploading into Blockchain Legal Institute. Um, just to keep up with the changes, but there are there are a lot of communities that we're helping. A lot of people that are unbanked are being helped by what you are doing as students and in this community, and that's why the the decentralized finance community was created. So, um, you know, look for the problems and solve them. I know that you guys are going to be creating some wonderful products and solutions. And I just welcome, you know, to learn about everything that you guys are doing. So reach out. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jackie. And, and of course, none of this is financial advice. Everything here discussed today 
um, is for educational purposes. We encourage you again to go out there, learn everything you can and get involved, get your hands dirty, go out there and, um, you know, build something, right? Um, you know, connect with Jackie, go to bli.tools. She has a, a plethora of educational resources on all things blockchain legal. So yeah, Jackie, again, thank you so much for taking the time today. Then yeah, uh, we'll give you the Discord invite so you can pop in and say hello to our students on Discord as well. I would love it. And I'm going to be at um, ETH Toronto again and other ETH community events. So definitely reach out, stop by and say hi to me if you see me. I'd love to talk to everyone. Sounds good. And, and we're also preparing for EdCon in Tokyo this year. So I'm sure that folks listening know about EdCon. This is going to be at an Olympic stadium in Shibuya, Tokyo. Uh, you know, we're doing this with the Ethereum Foundation. Vitalik is a headlining speaker. So we're really excited about that. And Jackie would absolutely love to have Blockchain Legal Institute there as well. Um, and yeah, we can chat more offline about that. I would love to be there too, um, for sure. Yes, keep me informed on all your events. I can't wait to see you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jackie. And yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in.